In the mid-1970s, an up-and-coming young animator was hired by Japanese film conglomerate Toho to pitch an idea for an animated TV series. The series, provisionally titled Around the World in 80 Days by Sea, was a loose adaptation of Jules Verne's classic science fiction story 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, focusing on a pair of orphan kids who rendezvous with the mysterious Captain Nemo while on the run from a set of villains. Unfortunately, the series never made it to air, and that up-and-coming young animator left to work on other projects. The animator in question was named Hayao Miyazaki. Though Around the World in 80 Days by Sea was never produced, Miyazaki would use concepts from the show throughout his work, beginning with his directorial debut, the 1978 TV series Future Boy Conan. After Conan ended its run, Miyazaki would become one of the most preeminent directors in the history of animated film, starting with the 1979 Lupin III movie, The Castle of Cagliostro, and continuing with a string of acclaimed films for both Topcraft and later, the legendary studio Ghibli. As renowned as his work has become, for the first decade of his film career, Miyazaki was not particularly well known among general audiences in Japan. His core audience, for most of the 1980s, was hardcore anime fans, thanks in no small part to his close relationship with the nation's most popular anime magazine, Animage. But starting at the end of the decade, this began to change. To put things in perspective, in 1988, My Neighbor Totoro earned a total of 588 million yen at the Japanese box office. A little over a year later, when Kiki's Delivery Service was released to theaters, it earned 2.17 billion yen at the Japanese box office. From that point on, Miyazaki was the most popular animated film director in Japan, a position he retains to this very day. At around the same time, executives at Toho dusted off their outline for Around the World in 80 Days by Sea. Despite the show never making it to air, they retained the broadcast rights, and perhaps because Miyazaki was seeing a surge in mainstream popularity, they thought it a wise idea to begin producing the show in earnest. But Miyazaki was now one of the heads of Studio Ghibli, so any thought of securing him as director was a lost cause. If Toho was serious about going forward with the proposal, they would need to find another director, at another studio, to bring it to fruition. In 1988, Gainax was hard at work on Gunbuster, their first major creative project since the box office failure of The Wings of Oniamis the year before. Thankfully, to the satisfaction of all involved, Gunbuster became the studio's first bona fide success. While not a phenomenon by any stretch of the imagination, the show sold well, and ended up placing 12th in that year's Animage Grand Prix. This placed it just below Kimagori Orange Road, and six places above Pat Labor, the OVA series that primary financiers Bandai predicted would be the greater success. An objectively modest victory, but it certainly must have felt like a major accomplishment for the studio and its first-time director, Hideaki Anno. Gainax would continue working on Gunbuster until July of 1989, with the release of the fifth and sixth episodes. While this took up most of their time and resources, Gunbuster was far from the only thing the studio worked on during this period, as once again they took up a number of smaller projects to keep busy. The first one came about thanks to General Products, Gainax's sister company that was best known for operating the first science fiction specialty shop in Japan. By the late 80s, General Products had followed Gainax in relocating their base of operations to Tokyo, as most merchandising licensors, as well as their biannual garage kit trade show Wonderfest, were located in the capital. Once re-established, the company once again began courting new companies for profitable licensing opportunities, and in the late 80s, there was one property above all that was basically guaranteed to print money. On May 27, 1986, Enix published Dragon Quest on the Nintendo Famicom. This was a watershed moment in the history of video games, essentially creating what we now know as the Japanese role-playing game, and indisputably proving that the mechanics of the RPG genre could successfully be streamlined and translated to home consoles. Japanese Famicom players fell in love with the simple yet rewarding gameplay, Akira Toriyama's iconic designs, and Koichi Sugiyama's monumental soundtrack, and they showed that love by buying the game in droves. Dragon Quest sold 1.5 million copies, its sequel, Dragon Quest II, sold 2.4 million copies, and Dragon Quest III sold a mind-boggling 3.8 million copies. 
The series was so unbelievably successful that Enix promised, after Dragon Quest III's release, that they would only put out new entries on weekends so as to avoid children skipping school to buy the game, a promise they continue to honor to this day. It's up for debate, but the argument can be made that by the late 80s, Dragon Quest was the most popular media property in Japan, and as such, General Products was more than eager to try and work out a licensing deal. The company quickly hit a roadblock, however, as Enix could not grant them the license to Akira Toriyama's characters, which are by far the most iconic aspect of the series. This, however, was not a problem. Yasuhiro Takeda, president of General Products, would go on to explain to Enix that what they really were after was the license for the game's equipment and items. Enix was intrigued. No other company had ever approached them with such an offer, and as such, they agreed to a business relationship. General Products would go on to create a line of Dragon Quest merchandise, the most elaborate being a soft vinyl replica of the Sword of Erdrich. The success of the merchandise would lead to Gainax and Enix collaborating on a unique project called Dragon Quest Fantasia. This was a video consisting, in part, of a performance of the game's soundtrack by an orchestra conducted by composer Koichi Sugiyama, with the rest consisting of live-action recreations of various scenes from the game. These scenes, co-directed by Takeda and Gainax co-founder Takami Akai, are in the style of the popular tokusatsu series of the day, and while seeing anything Dragon Quest related that doesn't resemble Akira Toriyama's designs is a bit jarring, these scenes are nevertheless quite nice looking, which is perhaps not surprising considering Enix's resources and Gainax's experience in creating tokusatsu projects during their Daikon film days. Around the same time, Gainax would also produce one more music video, this time for ex-Bowie guitarist Hotei Tomoyasu's song Guitar Rhythm. The video is similar in style to Gainax's work on Fence of Defense's Data No. 6, in that most of the animation is cool, abstract effects, as opposed to anything telling a definite story. Another project made during this time is potentially the most obscure in Gainax's catalog. The studio had wanted to create a TV series based on the short stories of sci-fi author Shinichi Hoshi, which was to be called Shinichi Hoshi Gekijo. When Gainax met with Hoshi to ask permission to animate his work, he responded with a flat no, saying he doesn't want anyone adapting on anything he's written until well after he's dead. Undeterred, Gainax approached another sci-fi author, Sakyo Komatsu, for permission to animate his work instead, and thankfully he agreed to such an adaptation. Thus, Sakyo Komatsu Anime Gekijo began airing on Japanese TV in 1989. Unfortunately, because the project is so obscure, it has never been translated into English, and thus I cannot say anything more of substance about it. The same must also be said of Gainax's final minor work of 1989, a one-episode OVA called Beat Shot. Based on the manga series of the same name by Satoshi Ikazawa, Beat Shot is the story of Kyoichi Sasuga, a golf player who uses his skill at the sport as a means of picking up women. From what I can tell, the sex comedy aspects of the show take center stage here, which is further emphasized by the OVA's alternate title, Watch Me Sink My Putts. Ugh. Given anime's, shall we say, not-so-stellar track record when it comes to sex comedies, we're probably not missing much in it never being translated into English. Further, it's unclear just how much creative control Gainax had in the project. Anime News Network credits AIC, Sea Moon, and Magic Bus as working on the OVA as well, and save for crediting Toshio Okada as one of the planners, no other Gainax regular seems to have been involved. Regardless, by all accounts, Gainax was at a high point in the late 80s. They were getting constant work, and Gunbuster's success had given them cult status among Japanese fans. When production on Gunbuster wrapped in July of 1989, the studio was more than eager to begin another successful project. However, what happened afterwards would nearly cause the infant studio to close its doors for good. Hiroaki Inoue had been a fixture of Gainax since the very beginning, back before the studio was even called Gainax. Back when they were still just a bunch of college kids trying to organize sci-fi conventions in Osaka, Inoue, then a representative of the Space Force Club, provided valuable organizational assistance. Later, when the studio had been properly formed, Inoue's experience working as a producer for Tezuka Productions was instrumental in them obtaining funds to begin production on the wings of Oniamis. Perhaps because of this heightened sense of his own importance, Inoue had begun to attempt to wrest power away from studio president Toshio Okada, creating a power struggle between the two men. In spite of his efforts, Inoue's attempt to secure a leadership position were to be in vain. Okada began discussions with two of Gainax's other founders, Takami Akai and Hiroyuki Yamaga, about bringing in someone else to help run the company. At some point in the discussion, one of the men suggested Takeshi Sawamura, 
Sawamura was another figure of the studio's pre-Gainax days. He had been active in the Osaka sci-fi clubs, and later ran general products with Takeda until 1985, when he left the company due to professional disagreements. Sawamura agreed to come on board as co-president, and with that, Inoue lost his opportunity to secure power. The leadership was now close to him, Inoue did not stop trying to secure power, he just looked for a more clandestine avenue to do it. In late 1989, Gainax was sent a job offer from another studio called Group TAC. Founded in 1968 by several ex-members of Mushi Productions, Group TAC was, by the late 80s, most famous for their work on the phenomenally successful TV adaptation of Mitsuru Adachi's baseball manga, Touch. Aside from their conventional animation projects, Group TAC also did behind-the-scenes work, especially in the realm of audio engineering. This is, in fact, how Group TAC and Gainax became acquainted, as Group TAC had assisted on the audio engineering on Gunbuster. The relationship between the two studios must have been a positive one, as Gainax ended up naming the captain of the Excelion after one of Group TAC's audio directors, Atsumi Tashiro. In response to this, when Group TAC had begun planning their next major new project, they have turned to Gainax to help bring it to life. The project in question was to be done in collaboration with Toho and Japan's public broadcaster NHK, who were by this point hell-bent on turning Miyazaki's old Around the World in 80 Days by Sea proposal into a TV series. At the time, they were looking for character and environmental designs, and so, at the suggestion of Group TAC, they sent a design request to Gainax. Acting entirely on his own, Inoue intercepted the request and began working on it while leaving Gainax's upper management completely in the dark, even getting animators Mahiro Maeda and Yoshiyuki Sadamoto to contribute designs as well. In the end, NHK and Toho accepted their designs and brought Gainax on board to create the show. Of course, these kinds of secret machinations never remained secret for long, and sure enough, Okada and the rest of Gainax soon learned just what Inoue had been up to, but by then it was too little too late. The deal had been made, and Gainax was now committed to a project that, according to Takeda, would wind up leaving them at least 80 million yen in the red. Obviously, Okada was furious, and immediately gave the show's producers an ultimatum. Either Inoue leaves the project, or Gainax would strike. The producers sided with Okada, and in response, not only did Inoue leave the project, he left Gainax entirely, jumping ship to AIC. With Inoue out of the picture, Gainax may have been free of the power struggle that had plagued the studio, but they had no choice but to work on his project, despite condemning them to even more debt. Yoshiyuki Sadamoto was brought in to direct, but after a very short time, he decided he would rather focus on character designs, and thus, just as had been the case with Gunbuster, Hideaki Anno was asked to be the replacement director, and once again he accepted. With Anno at the helm, production ramped up in earnest, and on April 13th, 1990, NHK premiered the first episode of Nadia, The Secret of Blue Water. The story of Nadia opens amid the chaos of the 1889 World's Fair in Paris, the same World's Fair where the Eiffel Tower was first unveiled. Amidst the 32 million visitors estimated to have visited Paris for the fair is jean roque Raltigue, a boy from the port city of Le Havre who's visiting with his uncle in order to take part in a contest to see whose flying machine can stay airborne the longest. As a quick historical note, no such contest appears to have been part of the 1889 World's Fair but flying machines did make a prominent appearance when the World's Fair returned to Paris in 1900. Anyway, as Jean wanders around awestruck by the magnificence of the capital and the myriad scientific wonders on display, that awe vanishes the instant he catches glimpse of a young, dark-skinned girl, wandering alone with a baby lion cub. The girl is the titular Nadia, an orphan who basically works as a slave in a traveling circus. As if that weren't bad enough, she's being pursued by a trio of thieves called the Grandis Gang, led by the fiery redhead Grandis Granva and her two henchmen, Sanson and Hansen, who are after a mysterious gem in her possession known as the Blue Water. Jean, unwilling to see his new dream girl in such dire straits, convinces Nadia to join him, promising to not only help her escape from the Grandis Gang, but to bring her to Africa, where she believes she comes from. Even at this early stage, we can clearly see the influences from both Miyazaki and Jules Verne. Miyazaki's hand in the initial series outline is obvious in the show's Western European setting and obsession with flight. 
Further, Nadia's blue water bears more than a passing resemblance to Shita's mysterious amulet from Miyazaki's 1986 film Castle in the Sky. In fact, Castle in the Sky's entire first act, with Shita being pursued by Dola before being rescued by Pazu, seems to echo Nadia as well. This is certainly no coincidence, as Miyazaki apparently reused elements from his initial Around the World in 80 Days by Sea proposal when making Castle in the Sky. And since we're on the topic of Gainax's anime influences, let me quickly mention one more. The Grandest Gang is a clear shout-out to a set of character archetypes made famous from the 1977 science fiction series Time Bokan. These characters, who would reappear in the many spiritual successors to Time Bokan throughout the 1970s and 1980s, always consisted of an attractive woman as leader and two male henchmen, one tall and skinny, the other short and stocky. If you think this sounds familiar, that's probably because you grew up watching Pokémon, as Team Rocket is another obvious shout-out to these character archetypes. Just replace the short and stocky one with Meowth, and it's basically the same thing. Anyway, getting back on track. As for Vern, his influence is most obviously felt in the atmosphere of reverence for this new age of scientific discovery. Jean is the most obvious example of this. Not only is he awestruck by the technological advancement around him, he's an inventor himself, albeit not the greatest one in the world by any means. But it's more than just this scientific reverence, as the show similarly does an excellent job at reproducing the atmosphere of terror and anxiety invoked by the opening pages of Vern's novel. Before we see any of Paris, the first scene of the first episode is an ominous narration, detailing a mysterious series of attacks on ships on the high seas. Most believe they're the work of sea monsters, but, as this is the age of empire and imperialism, most of the world powers cannot shake the suspicion that the attacks are the work of a clandestine power causing chaos behind the scenes. The aura of unease provides a striking contrast to the gaiety of the World's Fair, leaving the audience with expectations of dread in spite of the series' general levity. This brings up an interesting point about Nadia. The show is, tonally, all over the place, and this is evident even in these early episodes. There's the apprehension present in the opening, the unhinged anything-can-happen mentality of early science fiction and adventure stories, the descent into goofy comedy whenever the Grandest Gang is on screen. I know a lot of fans take issue with these wild shifts in tone, and honestly, I'm sympathetic to their criticisms. There are a lot of recent shonen action shows, for example, that have these out-of-nowhere comedic moments that, for me personally, kill the mood of whatever series I'm watching. And just so I don't appear to be singling out modern anime and manga here, this is a trend that's decades and decades old. The god of manga himself, Osamu Tezuka, was infamous for doing this in his manga, and those moments are usually excised from the animated adaptations of his work. With all this being the case, why then does Nadia not bother me? Like I said, I feel the series establishes its tones right from its initial moments. This is in complete contrast to something like the first volume of Tezuka's Phoenix, where he's attempting to tell this somber tale of ancient warfare, but then out of nowhere throws in some off-the-wall gag that's closer in tone to a Family Guy cutaway. I much prefer stories like Nadia's that tells you up front what you're in for. And I know that comedy is subjective, but the comedic moments in Nadia were consistently entertaining to me. They made me laugh, and Gainax is generally very good at keeping the comedy and the drama in their place without it feeling jarring to me. There are, of course, moments when they fail at that, but these to me were the exceptions rather than the rule. Alright, let's get back to the show itself. These early episodes are variations on the theme of Nadia and Jean trying to escape from the Grandis Gang. In Paris, in Le Havre, on an American battleship. Perhaps one could argue that it's a bit repetitive, but this never bothered me. Gainax's skill in crafting both exciting action scenes and cliffhangers to end the episodes meant I was always on the edge of my seat. And those action scenes. Most TV anime of the early 90s were not exactly animated tours de force, but Nadia consistently looks fantastic. The colors are bright, and the animation itself is smooth and pleasing to look at. And that animation is always punctuated by a fantastic soundtrack, courtesy of composer Shiro Sagisu who's capable of creating incredible music to work with any situation, regardless of tone. Anyway, we should move on before anyone gets the idea that action and adventure is all one gets out of the show. And indeed, these early episodes are a wonderful showcase of the dynamics between Nadia and Jean. As I said before, the two characters share a common heritage in that they're both young orphans, but aside from that, they're actually quite different. Jean, in all aspects of his life, is the eternal wide-eyed optimist. He sees nothing but wonder in the era's scientific breakthroughs, and though he may not be the world's greatest inventor, that doesn't stop him. 
He always believes what he creates will continue to improve. This optimism extends to another aspect of his life as well. Like Noriko in Gunbuster, Jean's father went missing in an accident, ostensibly involving a sea monster. But unlike Noriko, Jean is unwaveringly certain that he's still alive. Compare him to Nadia. Unlike Jean, we aren't privy to what happened in her past. Hell, even Nadia herself doesn't know where she comes from, only assuming that she probably comes from Africa because of the color of her skin. But at this point, that almost doesn't matter. She's got no family, she's basically a slave, and before Jean comes around, she had literally nobody she could depend on. To the surprise of nobody, then, Nadia is very cold and distant. When Jean introduces himself, Nadia straight up says she wants nothing to do with him. It doesn't take too long for her to warm up to him, but even then, her attitude seems like it can change on a dime. This is most obvious in her reactions to Jean's inventions. She's impressed when she first sees them, but the second they break down, which at this point happens fairly often, she becomes totally dismissive. This hot and cold attitude has not resonated well with some fans. I've heard reviews where Nadia is straight up called a bitch. I find this to be somewhat unfair. Yes, poor Jean does get beaten down at times, but Nadia's reactions have always made sense to me. She doesn't want to be alone, but how can she be expected to open up to anyone easily at this point? Literally the only people in her life were her slave master and a group of thieves who only care about stealing the blue water. She may want a friend, but experience has taught her to expect the worst of everyone. As she says in episode 4, doing what she's been doing is a hell of a lot safer than believing in anybody. Dismissing her as a bitch doesn't do justice to the unfortunate realities of her situation. The same can be said of the other aspects of Nadia's character that I've seen dismissed, her pacifism and her vegetarianism. We're introduced to both in episode 3, when the two kids are eating on the American battleship Abraham with Professor Ayrton. Nadia refuses to eat fish, even at the risk of starving herself, because it's a living thing. Further, she not only refuses to be impressed by the scientific prowess of the Abraham, but actively tries to convince the Navy not to engage with an attacking sea monster. In this, Nadia as a character is closest not to Miyazaki's Shita, but to his Nausicaa. In her eponymous film, Nausicaa, like Nadia, refuses to kill the Omu because she respects all life. At a later point, she willingly volunteers to be a prisoner of the wicked Princess Kushana so as to avoid bringing war to her homeland. Why Nadia seems to get criticized more than Nausicaa is probably because she's much more preachy and overzealous. But beyond that, I feel that some fans may be reading her activism as some sort of authorial tract. Hideaki Anno himself is a well-known vegetarian, so it can't be a coincidence that a heroine of his is an outspoken vegetarian as well. My issue with this is that it assumes we're supposed to completely sympathize with her activist outbursts when, at least to me, it's clear that we aren't. A major difference between Nadia and Nausicaa is that I think Miyazaki absolutely wants us to sympathize with everything Nausicaa does. She's a completely idealized portrait. Nadia's activism, by contrast, is never taken at face value. The other characters often challenge her and argue that she's taking things too far. This would suggest that the arguments of the show, and the arguments of Nadia herself, are meant to be seen as two different things, which is something I'll come back to in a bit when I talk about Gargoyle. Anyway, that sea monster that attacked the Abraham, it ends up sinking the ship, throwing Nadia, Jean, and King the Lion Cub overboard. The three wake up in what feels like a prison cell. They assume they've been eaten by a sea monster, but Jean deduces that these sea monsters are actually giant submarines. This one in particular is called the Nautilus, commandeered by the enigmatic Captain Nemo. Nemo is by far the most famous thing to come from Verne's novel, and for good reason. He's by far the story's most interesting figure. To compare him to another famous anime character, he reminds me of Captain Harlock. They're both mysterious men who've become captains of a ship living in virtual isolation from the rest of civilization, fighting against what he sees as tyranny in any form, always on the side of the oppressed and the downtrodden. He's a fascinating character. The only problem is it feels like Vern didn't realize how intriguing a character he created, and that touches on my biggest issue with his novel. So much of it consists of endless descriptions of either machines or marine life, for what seems like no other reason than Vern was just fascinated by it. Maybe this was acceptable in 1870, but reading it now, it just makes the novel drag, and drag, and drag some more. If I want to see undersea plant life in excruciating detail, that's what David Attenborough documentaries are for. I wanted more of Captain Nemo, and Vern didn't give it to me. 
Thankfully, Gainax is a studio that has no problem taking what it wants from their sources without being 100% faithful, and Nadia benefits from this in its portrayal of Captain Nemo. He's now a major character. He still retains that aura of mystery and distance from his literary ancestor. The fact that he has a blue water of his own makes us immediately question his identity, but, as we'll soon discover, he's now got a concrete goal that makes him a bit easier to connect to. Also, he's a bit softer. In the novel, he didn't allow the main characters to leave the ship once they came aboard, effectively making them prisoners. This Captain Nemo isn't nearly as rigid. He allows Nadia and Jean to leave so long as they keep what they saw a secret. He even fixes Jean's flying machine free of charge, so yeah, that's a nice gesture. And we gotta give him credit for basically being Captain Global from Macross, and I mean that literally. The two have identical character designs. I'm guessing the only reason why Gynax didn't get sued is because so many of them worked on the show that this was effectively an act of self-plagiarism. Getting back on track, in a monumental act of terrible luck, Jean's newly repaired flying machine ends up getting shot down immediately after they leave. They end up stranded on an island that's being terrorized by an army of... Oh my god, it's the clan. It's the fucking clan. No, I'm kidding, it's not the clan, but I'm sure it's no coincidence that this show that very prominently features a number of protagonists of color are up against villains who are wearing what can be called nothing else but clan hoods. So, who are they really? They're Neo-Atlantis, led by the villainous Lord Gargoyle. Basically, they're a combination of the Clan, the Nazis, the Empire from the original Star Wars trilogy, and I'm guessing every 19th century imperial power in the world, given that their theme song is a blatant echo of rural Britannia. Anyway, what exactly they want can wait until later. Right now, Gynax only needs to establish how evil they are, and they do this in what is perhaps the saddest scene in the entire show. Nadia and Jean are walking around the island when they discover a series of bodies laying strewn about. A little girl, Marie, is unharmed, but to their horror, they discover her mother, father, and dog have all been shot to death. They hide to escape the clutches of Neo-Atlantis, and Marie, unaware of the severity of the situation, asks about her parents, with Nadia and Jean responding that they're not here right now. But obviously, this is a secret they can't keep forever. The three bury them, and Nadia tells Marie that her family is dead. Marie is too young to even begin to comprehend the concept of death, screaming that she wants to go with them. This completely breaks Jean, who tells her that she's never going to be able to see them again. It's at this point the horror of what's happened finally clicks with Marie, and she begins to cry uncontrollably. This is such an impeccably done scene. We've already seen how the show isn't afraid to tackle suspense, comedy, and adventure, but this is the first time it's approached pure, heart-wrenching sadness. And remember, this is a children's show. Gynax deserves all the credit in the world for being willing to tackle the subject of death in such a mature way. Just because a show is made for children shouldn't preclude it from being able to handle serious subjects. Anyway, the Grandest Gang is captured by Neo-Atlantis, and it's here that we get our first impression of what they're after. Turns out, they're also after Nadia's Blue Water, and they were, in fact, the ones who put out the rewards for its capture in the first place. Soon enough, Marie and later Jean fall into Neo-Atlantis' clutches, and in order to save Jean, Nadia volunteers to be captured in his place. She gives him the blue water to hide, and leaves as Neo-Atlantis' prisoner. Gargoyle suggests that he knows who Nadia is, intriguingly referring to her as Princess Nadia. Once again, he demands the blue water, or else Marie and King will die. Unwilling to let the little girl and her pet be killed, Nadia reluctantly tells them the blue water is in Jean's hands. Soon enough, the entire island is redirected to look for Jean, while Gargoyle, no doubt convinced of his impending victory, gives Nadia a tour of the island. On this tour, Gargoyle is not shy about what he's trying to accomplish. He declares to Nadia that Neo-Atlantis' mastery of science has given him dominion of both nature and the human race as a whole. This, again, is an echo of Miyazaki, who often links his villains with both technology and industrialization. But again, I don't think Gainax is adapting Miyazaki's ethos wholesale, and Anno has been very upfront about this. At his panel at AnimeCon 91, Anno told his audience that he likes technology, but not necessarily the values that tend to be associated with it. Miyazaki, he argues, likes neither the value system nor the technology itself. 
and I think this difference between the two men is reflected in Nadia. Obviously, Gargoyle retains the ominous view of technology typical of Miyazaki, and Nadia herself, in her activist mode, decries technology's ease of causing war and suffering. But if we're to find a character that's meant to embody what Gainax is trying to say about technology, I think that character is Jean. He's fascinated by technology. The reason he got mixed up in the story at all is because he was in Paris to enter his flying machine in a contest. He sees the wonder it can bring, and the aid it can provide to human beings, but he's also aware of its potential for destruction, like when he and Nadia are aboard the Abraham. But unlike Nadia, he recognizes that the world would be much worse if, say, there was no Nautilus to stand defiant against neo atlantis tyranny. To put it simply, technology without heart, without actively working to maintain a balance between nature and the needs of the human race, is a broken philosophy, and nothing illustrates this more than the cornerstone of the Neo-Atlantean Empire, a colossal superweapon known as the Tower of Babel. Basically, this is Neo-Atlantis' Death Star. Gargoyle even demonstrates his power by obliterating a neighboring island just as the Empire vaporized Alderaan in A New Hope. With such an abomination in their midst, our heroes need to get off that island and stop Neo-Atlantis as soon as possible. Nadia doesn't have to wait long, as Jean meets up with the Grandest Gang, freshly busted out of prison, and this new alliance heads to rescue Nadia, Marie, and King. Gargoyle corners them in Neo-Atlantis' submarine, the Garfish. Thankfully, Captain Neo rushes in with the Nautilus in the nick of time. As a last resort, Gargoyle activates the Tower of Babel a second time, but before it can be used, the reactor goes haywire, reducing their hideout to ash. Our heroes may have escaped, and the Tower of Babel may be out of commission, but the war with Neo-Atlantis is far from over. For now, though, everyone is just happy to be alive. Since all the characters really have nowhere else to go, they stick around the Nautilus. This is one of the two big ways the status quo changes from here on out. Nadia and company are no longer on the run. The second big change? Grandis completely abandons her mission of capturing the Blue Water, because once she gets an eyeful of Captain Nemo, she falls in love with him at first sight, declaring that love is greater than jewels. She literally says that in episode 12, perhaps a bit on the nose, but I guess it's not entirely out of place in a children's show. Even with these changes, the show progresses just as it had in earlier episodes. Sometimes the focus is on high-stakes adventure, such as when the Garfish chases them through a minefield, or when the Nautilus descends to a secluded reef to find a cure when Nadia and Marie come down with a rare disease. Other times the focus is on comedy, like when Grandis tries and fails to cook fish for the crew. Regardless of what it chooses to do, it does it splendidly, while continuing to show the depth that always set it a tear apart from its contemporaries. I kind of joked about this earlier when I was introducing Neo-Atlantis and commenting on how they're dressed like the clan, but in all seriousness, Nadia is a show that, more than any other anime of its day, and even most made today, honestly, features a number of prominent people of color as main and supporting characters. There's Nadia herself, of course, and Captain Nemo, and much of the Nautilus's crew as well. Up until this point, the show has never explicitly commented on this, but this changes in episode 12, when Jean observes the rest of the crew gathering supplies from an island they've docked at. Remember, this show is set in 1889. This kind of integration was unheard of, especially with everyone being treated as equals. Nemo tells Jean that everyone on the Nautilus shares the same goal, saving the world from Neo-Atlantis. With that kind of positive ambition, differences in race or national origin just don't matter. Aside from this, we see Nadia and Jean's relationship continue to evolve. Once it becomes clear that the Grandis gang have given up on their villainy, Jean is quick to respect them, with Nadia being a bit more hesitant. But Nadia also begins to show clear growth in a way we haven't seen before. When she's asked why she gets mad at Jean, she admits that she really doesn't know. A similar revelation occurs a few episodes later, after a hunting party from the Nautilus brings back a baby deer for the crew to eat. Nadia, of course, is furious, refusing to eat it and running away from the rest of the crew in protest. But in the midst of her breakdown, she admits that she's lonely, something that's been hinted at throughout the series but never admitted until now. She may be able to admit it to herself at this point, but not yet to others. Still, it's progress, but in the midst of this progress, Nadia and Jean once again have to confront death in a way not seen since the murder of Marie's parents in Episode 5. At the end of Episode 13, a Neo-Atlantean soldier threatens to shoot the Nautilus's crew, 
Before he can act, Nemo draws his pistol and shoots him point blank, killing him instantly. The act is presented in a deadpan, understated way that underscores the cruelty of their situation. At its core, regardless of how fun it may be at times, this is not an adventure. This is a war. Nadia, once again channeling Nausicaa, cannot stand to see even an enemy soldier die, but Nemo is unrepentant. The rest of the crew doesn't say a word. What words could possibly make better what they've just witnessed? Shortly thereafter, the Nautilus is bombarded in an attack by the American Navy, who've been duped by Neo-Atlantis' propaganda that they were responsible for the sinking of the Abraham in Episode 3. The attack damages the submarine, and poisonous gas begins leaking into one of the engine rooms. One of Jean's friends, an ensign named Fate, is trapped inside. Jean begs for Captain Nemo to save him, but the captain seals the room to prevent the gas from spreading, effectively condemning him to death. Now, this is a good episode, even though I need to dock a few points for Gynax resorting to one of my least favorite narrative tricks. Ensign Fate had not appeared a single time before his debut at the beginning of episode 15, and the fact that they front-loaded the episode with him before suddenly killing him off just feels cheap. Regardless, even though I think it would have worked a lot better if it was one of the other crew members that had died, the scene works as intended, as Jean, for the first time, realizes that regardless of how advanced the Nautilus's science is, it can't work miracles. Once the ship is stable, the crew makes a detour to lay their fallen comrades to rest. Under the sea, in the ruins of the lost city of Atlantis. This is another point that was taken directly from Verne. In his novel, the Nautilus does journey to Atlantis, but as is the case with much of the book, it lasts for what feels like a couple pages before moving on to something entirely different. In Nadia, this trip to Atlantis feels much more significant, even though we're not told that significance just yet. The fact that the antagonists are called Neo-Atlantis, and Captain Nemo is hell-bent on destroying them, and now seems to have access to the actual lost city of Atlantis? There must be something more to this, something we'll find out about in short order. Moving on, Jean is far from getting over the death of fate when he's hit with a much greater trauma. He's talking to Aiko when he learns that he's a survivor of a French ship that was destroyed by Neo-Atlantis, coincidentally the same ship his father was on. As Aiko was the only survivor, this gives Jean conclusive proof that his father is dead. For the first time, this beacon of positivity abandons all hope, but in response, also for the first time, Nadia attempts to cheer him up, reminding him of the promise he made at the beginning of the series to bring her to Africa. As a result, Jean finds the drive to craft a new and improved flying machine all by himself, but his efforts come to nothing. It's only when he asks Hansen for help, realizing that it's okay to rely on others and not doing everything completely alone, that his aircraft is completed, with Nadia once again regaining faith in Jean's promise. Afterwards, the Nautilus travels to their secret base in Antarctica, another adventure taken straight from Verne. Verne's Nemo claims Antarctica for himself, the only landmass on Earth not under the iron heel of the tyrannical rulers of civilization. Here, as before, we see how Gynax's Nemo differs from Verne's. Though he also keeps a base in Antarctica, it's not to seclude himself from his fellow man, but to aid in his fight in defense of it. To quote him directly in episode 19, he puts his faith in the power of mankind in the war against Atlantis. While the submarine undergoes repairs, Nemo shows our heroes the wondrous sights of the southern continent, ending with a mysterious meeting with a giant talking whale named Erion. Erion propels the mystery of Nadia's identity further by telling her she will soon meet her father and brother, but who exactly they are remains an enigma. Nadia is unable to ponder Erion's words for very long, as during a test of a rocket-propelled glider, Jean crashes the machine, which alerts Neo-Atlantis to the Nautilus's location. The aftermath of this scene shows just how far Nadia has progressed in such a short time. In previous episodes, such a colossal mistake would have earned him her ire, but now, she actually chastises Captain Nemo for calling him out, which causes him to give her a bright Noah-caliber slap to the face. In the midst of this avalanche of morale, the Nautilus is utterly decimated by Gargoyle and his army, leaving Nemo, in a last-ditch attempt to save the children, to quarter them in his cabin while he remains on the bridge. Nadia and Jean have no choice but to listen over the radio as their guardian ostensibly goes down with the ship, and this horror is only amplified a hundredfold when they hear a gunshot ring out. Electra, the Nautilus's second-in-command, has turned traitor and shot Nemo in the arm. So, Electra hasn't factored into this analysis much until now, and that's because she hasn't played a major role in the narrative. 
Of course, she's second only to Nemo in the Nautilus's chain of command, and aside from that, she's been somewhat of a mentor for Jean and a comedic rival to Grandis for Nemo's affection. The most we know about her personal life is that she lost a little brother to someone, probably Gargoyle. I wasn't going into this story expecting anyone on the Nautilus to turn traitor, but even if I was, Elektra wouldn't have made my short list of suspects, but here she is, doing just that. And it's all because, like everyone else on the Nautilus, she's also trying to overcome a debilitating trauma. Elektra, along with Nemo, lived in the Kingdom of Tartessos, the last remaining city housing the remnants of the Atlantean civilization. Nemo, as a matter of fact, was the king of Tartessos, and therefore head of the royal dynasty of Atlantis. Thirteen years ago, Gargoyle, along with a mysterious figure named Emperor Neo, attempted to seize power using the Tower of Babel as their ace in the hole. To stop the abominable machine, Nemo removed the blue water controlling the tower. Though this saved millions of lives in the long run, it caused the tower to spiral out of control and utterly destroy Tartessos in, to borrow another phrase from Nausicaa, seven days of fire. Electra's entire family was wiped out, and as a means of atoning for his sins, Nemo took her under his charge. Now, this is a good twist in and of itself, but what puts it in another level for me is the complexity of Electra's psychological profile. It would be easy enough for Gynax to just write Electra as a covert operative waiting for her chance to avenge her family, but there's so much more going on in her head. She originally wasn't even aware of Nemo's role in her family's death. She only knew that he was her savior, and as a result, fell in love with him. Once she found out about what happened, she must have been of two minds, hating him for what he did, but as the only one who had the audacity to challenge Neo Atlantis, respecting him enough to join his crusade. Even when his long-lost daughter, Nadia, yes, Nadia is indeed Nemo's daughter, joined the crew, he did not let that change his plan. In fact, he didn't tell Nadia about their relationship at all. But now, as the Nautilus is about to be condemned to destruction, he seems to have reneged on his promise of vengeance, saving Nadia and Jean, and refusing to launch an 11th hour suicide attack because, as Electra says, he's gone back to being a normal father. Her love, if you can call it that, is hanging on by the most tenuous of threads. As soon as Nemo does something that falls outside what she wants him to do, she's willing to once again become a specter of revenge. One can certainly argue how much she does, in fact, love him, now that that's common knowledge. Nemo, as always, is full of surprises. The real reason why he can't sacrifice himself is because he doesn't want to put Electra through the trauma of his death either. With that one sentence, Electra realizes just how wrong she was, and in her shame, is prepared to take her own life. Nemo stops her before sending Nadia and Jean away from their doomed submarine, saying, as his last words to them, Live, Nadia, live. Alright, that's a lot to take in at once, so at this point, it's probably worth assessing the progress of the show as of now. As of this writing, this is my third time watching the show in its entirety, and honestly, I'm blown away at just how much it does right. The animation, the music, the action and suspense, the pacing, the depth of its characters. There aren't very many shows that I would unironically call close to perfect, but Nadia is one of those elite few, and I'm far from the only one who feels that way. Nadia was an immediate hit when it debuted on Japanese TV in April of 1990. Gainax may have flirted with success with Gunbuster, but that show really only caught on among the hardcore fan community. Nadia was the studio's first work to court success among the general public. Ratings at NHK were extremely high, and as if that weren't enough, the fan community was even more zealous about Nadia than any other work Gainax had made up to that point. The show won the 1990 Animage Grand Prix by a landslide, but what's more impressive is that, in their monthly character rankings, the titular heroine was able to dethrone Miyazaki's Nausicaa after her years-long stranglehold of the number one spot. Nadia was anime's first bona fide phenomenon of the 1990s, which makes it all the more ironic that it was exactly this overwhelming success that nearly caused Gainax to implode. The secret blue Earlier in this video, when discussing Hiroaki Inoue's clandestine proposal that kickstarted Nadia's development, I mentioned that it would put the studio in the red to the tune of 80 million yen. This is true. However, the truth of the situation was much more dire than that description would suggest. Though Gainax clearly had a major hand in crafting the series into what it was, per the details of the contract, the studio was treated as a subcontractor. 
The rights to the show's residual success remained entirely with Toho, NHK, and other partners such as Group Tech and Korad. Simply put, as wildly successful as the show became, Gainax wasn't going to reap the benefits of any of it. They had to continue production for months while hemorrhaging money the entire time. It goes without saying that this was catastrophic for the well-being of the studio, and they had to do something to mitigate it. Throughout 1990 and 1991, they would, in fact, greenlight a series of short OVA projects in an attempt to stop the bleeding, but none of these projects would be successful either, just making the situation worse. The only reason why the studio didn't completely self-destruct as a result is because, at around the same time, they had stumbled into success as a developer of video games. Gainax's history as a video game developer began in 1989, when Takami Akai had decided to visit Yasuhiro Takeda as he was recovering in the hospital after a skiing accident. Back when the crew was still headquartered in Osaka, Akai had bought his first computer, and soon afterwards began exploring the world of PC games. While he enjoyed what he played, he nevertheless felt that most of what was on the market was underdeveloped. Up until that point, most of the graphics in PC games were designed by the programmers themselves, not dedicated artists. Since Gainax was first and foremost an animation studio, Akai believed they could create games that were a cut above the rest in terms of graphical aesthetics. Takeda greenlit the idea, and on July 15th, 1989, Gainax's first PC game, Cybernetic High School, was released to store shelves. By today's standards, Cybernetic High School is incredibly primitive. You meet a series of girls at the titular school, they ask you questions, and if you get them right, they take off their clothes. Primitive it may have been, but Akai was right in predicting its success. Japanese fans loved the look of the game, and made it a massive hit. As a result, Gainax produced a number of follow-ups, with Cybernetic High School 3 even featuring characters from Gunbuster. The success of Cybernetic High School prompted Gainax to create a dedicated games division, which produced a number of successful projects including Battle Skin Panic and an adaptation of Kia Asamiya's Silent Mobius. But it was an idea from the mind of Toshio Okada that proved to be the studio's biggest hit. Going against the eroticized PC game trend of the day, Okada thought it could be an interesting idea to design a game where the goal is to raise a little girl, instead of having sex with her. Akai jumped at the chance to turn this idea into a reality, and on May 25, 1991, Gainax released Princess Maker. This became their biggest hit to date, and it spawned its own franchise of sequels and spin-offs, to say nothing of a series of imitators designed to cash in on its success. It's not an exaggeration to say that if these games had not been a success, Gainax as a company would have ceased to exist. The video game division's success was a result of two factors. Because, at the time, not a lot of staff was necessary for game development, costs could be kept low. On the first Cybernetic High School, for instance, aside from music and programming, Akai handled just about everything else completely on his own. As for the second factor, because Gainax made all their games themselves in-house, whatever profits they reaped would go right back into their pockets, completely avoiding a repeat of the Nadia debacle. To put things in perspective, Gainax may not have been able to collect on the royalties of the Nadia TV series, but when the Nadia video game became a hit in March of 1991, that was all theirs to keep. So while Akai and the rest of the video game division would keep the lights on at Gainax for the time being, this by no means meant production on Nadia became any less stressful. In fact, it became even more so, to such an extent that it caused director Hideaki Anno to have a mental breakdown. When Anno first entered the anime industry, his first professional job was on a TV show, Super Dimensional Fortress Macross. On that show, he was just a rookie animator, so he must have been shielded from most of the major stresses of the production process. Nadia would become only the second TV show he worked on, and this time, there was no way for him to be shielded from those stresses. Anime News Network credits Anno as animator, animation director, mecha designer, and overall series director meaning that not only was he in charge of the entire production, but would be responsible for large portions of the animation itself. This would be an enormous responsibility for anyone, and for Anno, who was completely unaccustomed to the pressures of creating a new episode of animation every week, this proved to be completely unsustainable, not just because of the intense temporal deadlines, but the actual working conditions demanded of him as well. Anno's credits on Gunbuster are of a similar level of extensiveness to Nadia's, but Gunbuster's production had a number of factors that kept it from spiraling out of control. Aside from the fact that OVAs do not have a set release schedule, Gunbuster itself was a much smaller project made under the auspices of a corporate sponsor who basically let them do whatever they wanted. And make no mistake, Anno flourished under that freedom. 
According to Okada, Anna would routinely make changes to Yamaga's screenplays, while his friend Shinji Higuchi would often be given permission to craft storyboards without any screenplays attached whatsoever. This sort of controlled chaos, as Okada described it, can only work on smaller projects where creators are given the freedom to create and the main staff knew each other well enough to play off each other's curveballs. Gunbuster was such a project. Nadia was not. For one, Nadia was much higher profile. There were many more moving parts in its production machine, including extensive amounts of animation and animation directing that was outsourced to Korea. The kind of environment they were accustomed to in projects like Gunbuster simply couldn't fly here. Further, NHK and Toho were much more hands-on than Bandai had ever been, meaning Mano had much less freedom to make the sort of changes he would have wanted to make. Further compounding his stress was the fact that he was struggling to come up with a suitable ending something Okada claims he was unable to do until three months before it was supposed to air. The proverbial straw that broke the camel's back was a decision that came from the minds of NHK. The network was beyond satisfied at how Nadia was doing in the ratings, and as such, extended the episode count to 39. Anna was already well past his breaking point, and the thought of having to extend this hell for even one more week must have seemed a nightmare to him. In response to this, he stepped down as director, appointing his close friend Shinji Higuchi to direct in his stead while he concentrated on crafting an appropriate ending. With so many aspects of Nadia's production going off the rails, there was no way the quality of the show wasn't going to be affected for the worse. And as it turns out, beginning with episode 23, this is exactly what happened. The episode starts off normally enough. Nadia, Jean, Marie, and King are floating away from the wreck of the Nautilus, with Jean and Nadia reflecting on the fate of Nemo and Electra. Marie asks them what's going on, but unlike with her parents in episode 5, they're unable to say a word, obviously because this situation hits them a lot closer to home this time. After a point, their little escape pod begins to flood, and Jean saves them by swallowing all the water, bloating exponentially, and in the process, completely shattering my suspension of disbelief. And so begins one of the most infamous filler arcs in the history of anime. This filler arc, which encompasses episodes 23 through 34, have for decades been referred to by fans as the Island Episodes. Now, for those of you who haven't seen all of Nadia just yet and may be a bit confused, since after all, a decent portion of the show takes place on some island or another, trust me, say the words Island Episodes to anyone who's seen the show and they'll know exactly what you're talking about. So what exactly goes on in these episodes? Basically, the kids wash up on a deserted island, God knows how far away from civilization. As castaways, they need to do what they can to survive, and try to rendezvous with the rest of the Nautilus' crew, if they're even still alive at this point. On the surface, this isn't inherently a bad setup. The show routinely does these kind of one-off adventure episodes, and this kind of environment would provide a good stress test for the next stage of Jean and Nadia's relationship. The major problem, of course, is that this is not just one or even two episodes. It's 12 whole episodes. That's almost 31% of the entire show. And if you think the absurd length of the arc is the end of it, oh, no, 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 no. We're just getting started. The pace of the show, obviously, is completely shot to hell. Episodes look atrocious for no discernible reason, and the characters are often flanderized to the point of parody. And the stuff they do on this island? I can just list some of them off, and I guarantee you're all gonna think I'm making them up. Jean sinks a passing ship by screaming really loud. Nadia spends half an episode, half an episode, trying to open cans. Jean eats magic mushrooms. Marie becomes wildly abusive towards King and throws him to the center of the sun. Sanson and Hansen, yes, them and Grandis are still alive too, build robot versions of King and race them around the island. I could go on for another paragraph or two if I really wanted, but I think you get the point. Now, I get that Nadia is a children's show, and it was never one to shy away from comedy, but this? This feels different. None of what goes on is funny. In fact, it feels radically inappropriate to the tone the show spent 20-some episodes working to establish. Part of what made Nadia so great is that it was a children's show that never felt like it was talking down to kids, but these episodes absolutely do. They're lowest common denominator Looney Tunes ripoffs. Nadia deserves much better than that. And what's most infuriating is that there are individual moments, very short individual moments, mind you, buried in all that garbage that are genuinely important to the story and characters. Nadia finally realizes that she loves Jean and kisses him for the first time. Later, she explains why she feels so strongly 
about not eating meat, and even later, the crew discovers some sort of metal fortress under the sea. But even those fleeting moments are tainted by association. Nadia only ends up kissing Jean after that horrible scene where he hallucinates on magic mushrooms. The only reason why the group finds the fortress under the water is because they discovered it after that completely unnecessary race with the two robot kings. That raises the question, is there anything in these island episodes that's unconditionally good? As a matter of fact, there is. Out of nowhere, episode 31 feels like a throwback to the great episodes of yore. True, much of it is an info dump, but that didn't bother me in the slightest. Nadia finds herself in the mysterious fortress, speaking to a disembodied voice. The voice confirms what we've already heard from Nemo. Nadia comes from Tartessos and is the Princess of Atlantis. But the voice doesn't stop there, going on to reveal the origins of the Atlantean civilization. The Atlantean people are actually a race of aliens from a distant galaxy, who made an emergency landing on Earth 2.4 million years ago. The fortress they're in, the Red Noah, is one of the original ships that landed on Earth in that bygone age. As a ruler of Atlantis, Nadia, by using the blue water as her conduit, is enigmatically destined to become either a god or a devil an obvious reference to Gonagai's Mazinger Z. In a tremendous show of personal growth, Nadia refuses her destiny. Her friends, her human friends, are infinitely more important than taking her place as Atlantean royalty. The voice in the Red Noah warns her that escaping that destiny is impossible, but for right now she doesn't care. Reuniting with Jean, she and the rest of the island castaways escape in the repaired Graton while the Red Noah sinks, causing the island to sink with it. An exciting ending, and the beginning of the following episode even begins with a recap of the entire island arc, lulling you into believing that it's finally over. But once the episode proper begins, the horrible truth begins to set in. Just because Nadia has left the island doesn't mean the island episodes have left Nadia. These next three episodes are, somehow, even worse than everything that came before. The crew crash lands in Africa, which I guess after Nadia finds out about her Atlantean ancestry, the whole Africa jaunt just seems a lot less urgent. Even with that being the case, these episodes are just horrible. The crew stumbles upon a tribe of natives that Ireton tries to communicate by repeatedly saying Jombo, Jombo, Jombo. Okay, look, I get that this is probably a joke at Ireton's expense, but still, just why? And then, and this is some of the most contrived bullshit I've ever seen, Nadia meets a dreamy island boy who she falls in love with for three episodes because he's never seen again past episode 35. And believe it or not, this guy just happens to know about Tartessos. I mean, come on, of all the villages they could have crash landed on, they happen to crash at the one with the one guy on the entire continent who knows where Tartessos is. I was going to call this a deus ex machina, but it feels so much more than that. This isn't just a god in the machine, this is the entire fucking Olympian pantheon in the machine. All of this culminates in episode 34, which is in the running for the single worst episode of anything I've ever seen in my life, and that's saying something considering I've seen Neo Yokio multiple times over. Much of this episode, if episode is even the appropriate word to use here, consists of a series of music videos, all set to clips from the show and using image songs sung by each of the characters. These songs aren't very good, and just as a concept, there's absolutely no reason for them to even be in the show at all. This is all framed around an A-plot where Jean is writing a song for Nadia to confess his true feelings, which he does by... <sighs> building a robot to play the ukulele. Now... Alright, look. I understand, as a critic, the impact I can have is limited. Listening to me talk about a show can never act as a substitute for actually watching the show yourself. But still, I want to do what I can to recreate, to the best of my abilities, how it feels to actually watch the show. That being said, because I'm a goddamn sadist, what I'm going to do here is play the English version of Jean's song to Nadia in its entirety and set it to choice clips of the island arc, so as to give you an idea of what it's like to sit through these 12 episodes. Have fun!
can't stand to be teased anymore when i look at you my heart beats for two i don't know what to do i love you nadia nadia i bet you don't know just how much i mean that oh jate nadia nadia you act so thoughtlessly Sometimes it makes me feel blue. Oh, please, Nadia, Nadia. Hardly a day goes by when you're not crabby. No, 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 Nadia, Nadia. I want to flinch and hide from. Thank you for saying that, so I don't have to. Alright, finally, that's the Island episodes. They've been a punching bag since the early 90s, and I more than believe their infamy is well deserved. So, who's to blame for all this? It would be really easy to just shove Shinji Higuchi under the bus, since he assumed the director's chair after episode 22, and right at episode 23 is where the show shit the bed. But to me, treating Higuchi as the scapegoat does nowhere near the justice of interpreting its context. Knowing what we know of Nadia's nightmarish production history, with its helicopter producers, last-minute episode count extensions, a staff unaccustomed to the rigors of TV production, and Anno's sudden breakdown, it would have been a miracle if the show hadn't shit the bed. That doesn't necessarily excuse how awful the episodes are, because let's not kid ourselves, these episodes are awful. But to me, there's a significant critical difference between knowing that something is bad because it was made out of sheer incompetence, versus knowing something is bad because the studio was dealt a bad hand. And the studio could not have been dealt a worse hand here. I can't imagine that Gainax was happy about their show falling this low. That recap at the beginning of episode 32 that basically made watching episodes 23 through 31 redundant seems proof of that. The studio knew they were better than this. They weren't going to allow this horrific series of episodes get the best of them. If it was any other studio, they may not have succeeded. This arc was bad enough that it easily could have taken the rest of the show down with it. But this wasn't any other studio. This was Gainax. This was the group of maniacs who went from being complete amateurs to leading the production of the highest budget anime film in history in a matter of only a few years. They knew the beginning of the show was great, and they knew they had the potential to raise it back to that level. And starting in episode 35, that's exactly what they did. The crew arrives at the ruins of Tartessos. As they explore, Nadia reveals to the rest of them the truths of her heritage and the history of Atlantis that she learned while aboard the Red Noah. At the end of the Red Noah episode, she seemed defiant, ready to refuse the life spelled out for her. But now, perhaps because standing in the midst of Atlantean history overwhelms her, she buckles under the weight of her own destiny and jumps off the top of a tower. The blue water's power breaks her fall, and only when Jean once again confesses his feelings to her does she realize what a mistake she's made. Unfortunately, Neo-Atlantis returns and bombards Tartessos. The crew is nearly decimated, but is rescued by, of all people, Electra, who brings good news. The rest of the Nautilus crew, Captain Nemo included, are not only still alive, but in command of a new Nautilus. 
Reunited, the new Nautilus launches a counterstrike against Neo Atlantis, but that counterstrike does not go well. Gargoyle obtains possession of both Nemo's Blue Water and Nadia, who once again sacrifices herself for the sake of her friends' lives. In custody, Gargoyle fills in the rest of the blanks of the history of Atlantis, most notably the fact that most of the myths from the Book of Genesis are basically imperfect recollections of early Atlantean history. As it turns out, human beings are the latest in a line of genetically engineered slaves for the Atlanteans, and this gets to the core of why Gargoyle is doing what he does. Human beings, to him, have always been and always will be inferior to the Atlanteans, and the fact that they are now the undisputed rulers of the planet is disgusting. Because of their inability to live without hating and destroying each other, human beings have forfeited the right to exist at all. As if that weren't enough, Gargoyle's true identity is revealed as the former Prime Minister of Tartessos, who has illegitimately seized leadership over the remaining Atlanteans by brainwashing Emperor Neo, Nemo's son and heir, and, by extension, Nadia's brother. Nemo confronts his former partner directly, and is met with a hail of bullets in response. It seems as though all hope is lost. Thankfully, the new Nautilus breaks in, and their arrival breaks Gargoyle's hypnosis over Neo, who returns the stolen blue waters. Unfortunately, Nadia has also been brainwashed, but Neo chooses to sacrifice himself to ensure that she is freed as well. In response, Gargoyle throws Jean to his death. In his weakened state, Nemo tells Nadia that combining both of their blue waters has the power to save Jean, but in doing so, the blue waters would be destroyed, effectively making Nadia's abandonment of her place on the Atlantean throne permanent. Nadia doesn't have to give it a second thought. Far from the moody loner she began the series as, she fully understands that a life without Jean isn't worth living. In the process, the Blue Waters emit a blinding light that Nemo warns will immediately kill any non-Atlantean who touches it. Gargoyle ignores his warning and is immediately turned into a pillar of salt. In the grandest sense of irony, the Atlantean supremacist turns out to have been a human all along. With Gargoyle dead, Nemo deals the finishing blow to Neo-Atlantis by destroying the Red Noah, sacrificing himself in the process. The man who swore he wouldn't rest until Neo-Atlantis was destroyed finally finished his mission. The series ends via a temporal shift 12 years later, revealing all the surviving characters came away from their journey with a happy ending. Hansen is a wealthy businessman, Grandis is a happy bachelorette, Marie and Sanson married, and of course, Nadia and Jean married. What a phenomenal ending this was. Far from letting the island episodes have the last word, the final five episodes of Nadia have returned the show to its former glory, arguably delivering some of the greatest moments in the entire series. Granted, most of it was action, but that was fine by me. One of Nadia's greatest strengths has always been its action scenes, and its character arcs were already well established such that they only needed to tie a bow around them, and they did that splendidly. And with all that being said, we should bring this episode of the history of Gynax to a close. Nadia was, in so many ways, a turning point in the history of Gynax. The show unintentionally revealed the limitations of the studio, both on a micro and macro level. On a micro level, it showed Hideaki Anno that he's the type of director who can really only thrive without hard deadlines and executive interference. On the macro level, it showed the studio themselves that they're far from invincible. Though by far the most successful project they've ever been a part of, Nadia is Gainax's biggest failure on a production level. The wings of Oniamis and Gunbuster had been harmonious, and Nadia was the exact opposite. Longtime friendships had ended, those in charge had suffered incalculable damage to their mental health, and the very life of the studio had been brought to the brink of extinction. Perhaps Gynax, in order to thrive, needed to avoid these kind of projects in the future. They needed to stick to smaller works to allow for the kind of close-knit working conditions that had sustained them up to that point. Perhaps working outside of that paradigm just wouldn't be possible for them. Perhaps controlled chaos was the only way for them to effectively function. That being said, the show should absolutely not go down in history as solely some portent of future doom for the studio. It deserves much more than that. As I said before, Gynax was dealt a hand that they could not possibly hope to win with, and yet they managed to still come out with nearly all the chips anyway. Comparing a show like Nadia to their previous works almost seems unfair. The Wings of Oniamis and Gunbuster were, in their own way, experimental character dramas while Nadia was a children's adventure show. We shouldn't condemn it for being different. We should judge it according to its own merits, and by its own merits, Nadia is a masterpiece. As far as children's entertainment is concerned, I'm hard-pressed to think of another show that does so much so well. Technically and artistically, Nadia is of the highest caliber, 
and as far as the story and characters are concerned, it may not be so far removed from Gainax's earlier works as one may initially believe. Themes that we've seen are so important to Gainax. Working through trauma, fighting for a better world, refusing to yield to negativity even when the odds seem so overwhelmingly stacked against you. Perhaps Nadia may not have been Gainax's show, in the sense that it came from the head of Miyazaki and the watchful eyes of Toho and NHK, but in the end, nobody would mistake it as anything but theirs. And anime itself is better because of that. Yeah.